All right, so we're going to do the optimization problem uh, involving the poster. So basically, we have a sheet of paper where we need to have 24 square inches of print, where we're going to have 1.5 inch margins on the top and the bottom, 1 inch margins on the left and the right, and I want to find the dimensions of the paper so the least amount of paper is used. So I read the problem, I hear the problem. To me, I hear least. I'm thinking right off the bat, all right, that means I want to minimize something, least, right? Minimize what? I want to minimize paper, but how do I make that mathematical? I want to minimize the area of the paper. So this is basically the situation I get. So what's my next move? Well, if I want to minimize area, it would make sense. I need an area function. So area of what? Area of this poster, it would be x times y. The problem with this, and not that it's a huge problem, but it's kind of an annoyance, is that I have area in terms of two variables right now. And honestly, I would prefer that I didn't have that. I would like to get it in terms of one variable. So is there a way I can get y in terms of x? Turns out there is, based off of what they gave me. If I just consider the dimension of the print, so the rectangular print here, this green line here, think about what that would be. It's not x, right? x is this whole thing. It's x minus the margins. Well, one inch on each side would mean that this is x minus 2. Likewise, if I think about this dimension, that's not y. The whole thing is y, right? It's y minus the margins. Well, the 1.5 inch margins on the top and the bottom mean this is y minus 3. I can use this now to get y in terms of x. I can say that x minus 2 times y minus 3 equals 24, right? Length of the area of a rectangle. Length times width equals area. So now I'm going to choose to solve for y. So I would divide both sides by x minus 2. And then I would go ahead and add 3 over. So I get y equals 24 over x minus 2 plus 3. So now I have y in terms of x. So I can come over here and substitute back in. So now instead of writing just a, I'm going to write a of x. My area function now is in terms of one variable x. So it would be equal to x times 24 over x minus 2 plus 3. All right, little distributive property. Distribute that x. I'm going to get 24x over x minus 2 plus 3x. So now I have a function that I want to minimize. This is my area function for this problem with all these constraints that I want to minimize. Where I go from here is, is, is kind, of up to, kind of up to you. I personally like to do intervals. And honestly, in this particular problem, the interval method might take me a little bit longer, but that's, that's the way I'm going to choose to show it to you. So what do you mean interval? Well, I want to get an interval for my variable. What is my variable? My variable is x. Well, what is x? x represents the, represents the length of the side of this paper. So all right, I know x can't be negative. Well, can it be 0? Can it be 1? Well, if we think about it, if I have to have margins, it's going to have to be at least 2. Otherwise, I won't have those 1-inch margins on either side. The question is, well, can it be 2? It turns out it can't be 2 for a couple of reasons. For one reason, if it was exactly 2, then I would only be able to have room for the margins, which means there would be no print. And the problem specifically said you need to have print on this piece of paper, on this poster. All right. If you didn't get it from that standpoint, you can get it from more of a mathematical standpoint. Look at the equation that we have for a. If x was 2, 2 minus 2 right here in the denominator, that's division by 0. That's no good. So it turns out that my x can be 2 or bigger. So x greater than 2 or 2 to infinity. Uh, all right, so I'm not going to get too much into the explanation of the interval, but I will make you think about this. Think about it. What's going to have to happen to y as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger so that I contain the same amount of print? Well, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, if I want to have the same 24 square inches of print, then y is obviously going to have to get smaller. right? But the idea is I can make x as big as I want. It's just going to make y smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? If we look at the expression for y, that kind of makes sense here because if I drive this expression, or if I look at this expression and drive x to infinity, this term would go to 0, y would approach 3, which makes sense because those are those margins. It'll never be 3, but it'll get closer and closer to 3. So that's basically how I come up with my interval. Now, what do I want to do with my interval? Well, if I have my interval, like I do here, my next move would be to do limits. So I would do the limit of a of x as x goes to 2 from the right. And let's see what we get here. Well, if I directly substitute, I get 48 over. And you're like, whoop, hang out. You're going to get 0 here. No good, right? Well, with limit problems, I won't write number over 0. I'll write number over tiny. Because if we think about it, x really isn't 2. It's going to 2. 
So that means this really isn't zero, it's going to zero. So that means it's gonna be a very small number. The question is, is it a positive small number or is it a negative small number? Well, it turns out it's a positive small number. And it's not that it just coincides with this symbol right here. All right, there's a little bit more to it. This is telling me I'm going to two from the right. Well, if I go to two from the right, let's pick a bunch of numbers that get closer and closer to two from the right and observe what happens in the denominator. For example, I'll start with three. Three minus two, positive one. Let me get closer to two. 2.5 minus two, that'll be positive 0.5. Let me get closer. 2.1 minus 2, that'd be positive 0.1. So you'll notice as I get closer to 2 from the right, this is getting closer to 0 from the right, so it's a positive small number. All right, so that's how I would interpret that. Now plus 3 times 2 is 6. So how do I interpret this whole sum here? Well, 48 over a very small number, positive number, is going to be a very large positive number. So the idea is as this goes to 0 from the right, 48 over that is going to go to positive infinity. And positive infinity plus 6 gets interpreted as positive infinity, a very large number. So now I'm going to take the limit of a of x as x goes to my other boundary, which in this case is x going to positive infinity. So what's that going to be? Well, again, limit of a sum, sum of the limits. The limit of this expression would be 24. I'm not going to get into y in this particular video. The limit of this expression, 3 times infinity, well, that would make sense that it's going to infinity. And 24 plus infinity, same type of thing. I can interpret that as positive infinity. Now, what was the point of me doing these limits? Do these limits give me any information? Well, they actually give me a lot of information. The fact that I got positive infinity for both limits to my boundaries tells me that, you know what? On this interval, there is no absolute maximum. However, there's going to be an absolute minimum. And since I'm a pretty good math student, I understand that, well, you know what? Well, where can that occur at? That's going to occur at a critical point at a place where the derivative is either zero or undefined. So as soon as I see these limits or I compute these limits, I like to write that down. Therefore, A has no absolute max, but A will have an absolute min at a critical point. So it's time to go get the critical point. So I got to get the derivative. So a prime of x. Well, the derivative of some, some of the derivatives. To take the derivative of this, I have to use the quotient rule. Quotient rule tells me to start in the bottom. I have x minus 2 times the derivative of the top. The derivative of the top would be 24. All right, derivative of 24x is 24. Minus the top, 24x, times the derivative of the bottom. Well, the derivative of x minus 2 would be 1 all over the bottom squared. And that is how I get the derivative using the quotient rule. Now I have to add that to the derivative of 3x, which would just be 3. If I clean this up a little bit, I can distribute the 24. I get 24x minus 48 minus 24x all over x minus 2 squared plus 3. Good things happen. What are those good things? Well, it turns out the 24x's are going to sum to 0. So c to them. And now I have my derivative, negative 48 over x minus 2 squared plus 3. What do I want to do with it? I want to set it equal to 0. So I'm going to take negative 48 over x minus 2 squared, set that equal to 0. Bunch of ways you can go ahead and solve this. I personally would add the 48 over, the 48 over x minus 2 squared over, I should say, the whole term. Then maybe cross multiply or multiply both sides by x minus 2 quantity squared, however you want to think about it. Divide by 3 x minus 2 squared equals 16. And where you go from here, again, is up to you. You can foil this out, distribute this out, I should say, and then subtract the 16 over and refactor. I definitely would not do that. What I would do is I would say, you know what, this is ready to go. Let's square root both sides. And so that I don't have to write absolute value of x minus 2 over here, I use the square root principle, right? So I plus or minus root that other side. And I'm going to get, I'm going to come back up here now, x minus 2 equals plus or minus 4. So basically I have two equations. I have x minus 2 equals 4, which means x could equal 6. And I have x minus 2 equals negative 4, which means x could equal negative 2. So I have two critical points, but it turns out I don't care about that one because it's not in my interval. So that means I only have one critical point in my interval. Well, if it's the only critical point I have in the interval, and these are the limits that I got, 
then this has got to be the value that's going to go ahead and minimize the area. So I don't even need to test it in the original function, the area function, which is typically what you do. All right, so now they asked for the dimensions. So what would my optimal dimensions be? Well, x equals 6 is 1. Now I've got to get y. And you're like, well, how are you going to get y? If only you had an equation for y. Well, it turns out I do have an equation for y. It's right here. So if I go ahead and plug 6 into that, 24 over 6 minus 2, that's 24 over 4, right? So that's going to be 6, and then 6 plus 3 is 9, so y equals 9. So 6 by 9 are going to be my optimal dimensions. Now, I probably should write a sentence justifying this. You know, more than just the limits and more than just this, maybe I should say something to the fact that since it was my only critical point, that's why it represents my min. I should probably write that. I'm not going to, but feel free to. Uh, and I do understand you can do this problem a totally different way with, without, the, without the limits. You can go ahead and just do a sine line. And, and since you'll only get one critical point for the sine line of the derivative, it's going to have to be an absolute max, uh, absolute min, I should say. I understand that. But this is just kind of process I wanted to uh, show on this particular problem.